Welcome in to episode three of the Will Wade podcast. I am not Jordy Collada. Um, I know I'm subbing in this week while Jordy's out. Um, <clears throat> we got Coach here uh, after another good big weekend of college basketball, NBA basketball. A lot to talk about. Um, Coach, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? I mean, you're not on vacation like freaking Jordy, so you got to be doing all right. <laughs> yeah, we're I mean, still- not all of us. Go out to Colorado for a week and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, no, he's he's living the life. We're still we're still here working. Apparently, um, coach. Apparently, it pays to be your own boss. <laughs> that's you, that's exactly right. Um, just to get it started uh, with some NBA stuff on, I think Friday, Nas had a big game. Um, you know, Towns has been out for a little bit, so Nas's role has expanded. Um, if you just want to talk about him as a player and kind of, you know, how his game was able to translate to the NBA. Yeah, I mean, he had 30, uh, he had 30 plus, the other, I think 33 or something the other night. Um, and and with, with, with Carl Anthony Towns out, he's obviously going to continue to get uh, more and more opportunity. But just a phenomenal uh, player, phenomenal talent. Uh, I mean, he's huge. He's seven foot. He can make shots. He can make post moves. You know, he can play anywhere you want to play. I mean, handle the ball. He's just so many uh, so many different things that uh, that he can do, and he's, he's he's ultra ultra talented. You know the Timberwolves. Timberwolves really like him. He's done a, he's done a really good job, and the Timberwolves like to play big. I mean, they got all those big guys after trading for uh, Gobert. Um, you know, they got they got a ton of big guys, and and Nas has kind of had to wait his turn a little bit this year, but I think he, uh, he he's taken full advantage of it, and and you know he's certainly. Um, going to continue to play well, continue to make things, uh, continue to make things happy. But I'm, I'm really, really happy for him. Really, really proud of him. He works extremely hard. Uh, he's uh, he's in great shape. I saw him in uh, last time I saw him in person was in May, um, and he was in or May, late May, or early June, and he was in phenomenal shape and, and working hard and getting ready to getting ready to get cranked up. So you know, I know he's he's put a lot of work into it, but. He's, uh, you know, he's he's getting some opportunity now with some of their injuries, and you know, it gives you an opportunity to step up, and he, he's done that thus far. Um, Staying in the NBA, there was a story that broke, um, you know, over the last week with the Celtics. A fan found the Celtics head coach's, well, what they think, uh, like a Quizlet with his uh, scouting reports of different teams. They were trying to figure out more about the Suns. Um, to talk about, and they ended up finding a Quizlet where he broke down uh, different players and had it on, you know, Quizlet, the website that students use to study for class. Um, and so I didn't, I just wanted to bring it up. I didn't know if there was any, you know, different things you would use for scouting reports to kind of get it to stick with uh, players better. Oh, yeah. Now, I wasn't technologically advanced enough to use Quizlet, but we, we had a quiz uh, before every game. So, Uh, Right before we went to shoot around, um, you had to get eight out of 10 correct on the quiz. I did it a couple different ways. A lot of times I do it on just old school pen and paper, spread them out because, you know, they all like to cheat. So you got to spread them out, make sure they're not copying off each other. And if you didn't get eight out of 10 right, you had a little bit of remedial school between uh, between the pregame meal and um, and the game and our stretching. So you had to come sit with me in the video room and let me um, tell you why I didn't think you were prepared and why you were going to get your ass whipped by a certain matchup that day. So we did it that way sometimes. Uh, one of my other favorites was I would give two or three questions and I'd, just, I'd ask them in front of everybody and everybody would have to answer them on call. So that was pretty good too because you could really – um, you know, in front of the team, everybody knew who was prepared or who wasn't uh, as prepared. And sometimes you'd get some crazy answers. And a lot of that was more on matchups and that sort of thing. But yeah, every game we gave a quiz uh, on the scouting report. We had gone over it, you know, numerous, numerous times. But we would do the quiz. You had to get eight out of 10. Um, and uh, sometimes I would do it verbally. The last year I did it a lot more verbally. I started doing it more verbally when we had COVID and I kind of stuck with that, but I would mix it up so they wouldn't know. Cause if I did it verbally, they knew a lot of times it was gonna be who their starting matchup was. So I kind of mix it up when they when they got used to that and, and, and changed the different ways I would do it. Sometimes I'd put a play on there and have them have to describe how we were gonna guard a play and I'd run through it on film and they'd have to write it out. So. I did a bunch of different things, but I thought that was important to add a little bit of teeth uh, to our uh, to our preparation. 
Um, well, now shift into uh, college basketball. Wait, 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 coach. <laughs> if you were able to find something like that on the internet, would you, I mean, obviously that would be such a built-in advantage, right? Like, did you have people that were kind of scouring the internet? Like, is this something that's well-known in the coaching circles, or is this a one-off? I think that's more of a one-off. I mean, we have people scouring the internet for information uh, on the opposing teams, but a lot of times that was more on who was going to play, who would be available, personnel type stuff more than, um, you know, more than more than game plan stuff. But we would certainly try to dig up everything we could to, to give ourselves an advantage. Yeah, um, <clears throat> this time of the year in college basketball, you know, it's different than, you know, really any other time of the season because, you know, the players are out of school. Um, you know, trying to wrap up finals, finishing finals, you know, the holidays. Is this a difficult time as a coach to try to keep um, the team corralled, or is it easier out of school than it is in school? Oh, I love this time of year. We were going two or three times a day, uh, depending on how I felt. We'd always do shooting and stuff in the morning, and then we'd come back and practice in the afternoon. Depending on how all that went, we may come back at night a third time. Um, so, no, I, I – this was a great time. I always thought our teams improved and got better during the Christmas break. Because, I mean, this is really, you know, your preseason, uh, you, you know, you've got to get in all your stuff. But who you are at the end of preseason is basically who you are till this Christmas break. Because you're playing games every three or four days. You don't have a lot of time to work on yourself. You're spending most of your time preparing for other teams. So when it gets to Christmas break, this is a – time really before conference season starts that you've got some time to um, work on yourself, improve yourself, get your, your team better. Um, and some of the stuff, you know, a lot of times during, during the season, you're just putting duct tape over, over some, you know, over some, some bad stuff or trying to put a little WD-40 here to clean this up, but you don't really have time to really do a, a, a big time deep clean and fix. And over Christmas, over this break, over this holiday break, you've got a time to do that, that, that clean and fix. And so I thought, uh, I thought this, was a, this was a great time of year. Our players may not have liked it as much because they didn't, they didn't have the built-in excuses to go to class or go do this or go do that that some of them liked. Um, but not that class was an excuse, but you know what I'm saying. Like they, didn't have, they, didn't, they, they had no excuse to tell me they couldn't be where I wanted them to be when I wanted them to be there. And, uh, and so, yeah, I always thought this was our time to get ready for SEC play. We'd always try to put in a couple wrinkles, maybe a new defense, test out a couple things. We'd always try to do that um, during this period. Now, there is a lot more free time. You got to worry about the guys with the, with the free time and there's nobody really on campus. Um, so there's, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of other stuff that can be going on around town. So you do have to monitor that. But my way of monitoring that was to make sure everybody was in the gym all the time or make sure we were around them uh, most of the time. But I thought this was a really, really good time of the year to, to, to get a lot done and to, to really, really improve. Yeah, and you, uh, you, you talk about getting ready for SEC play. Um, you know, we're getting, getting to that time. Uh, we saw South Carolina last Wednesday – um, they lost to UAB, um, which has a familiar face on it. Um, Air Gaines had 19 in that game. Um, he hasn't, you know, stuff in the stat sheet on the season, but it seems like every game there's a highlight clip coming out after. Um, when it came to Eric, what is, what is something that stood out? Like, what did you expect him to be, you know, as a player? Well, Gaines is, man, I mean, he's a, he's a big-time menace defensively. He can change the game with his, with his athleticism. Uh, you know, there's always a couple plays a game like you were like you were alluding to that he's the only guy in the gym who can make those plays just because of how athletic he is and um, you know how, how good of a how good of a player he is. But they're off to a great start at UAB. They've got one of the best backcourts in the country with him and Jelly Walker. Jelly Walker leads the country in scoring. I think he had 25 or 26 yesterday against Southern. Um, but he leads the, he leads the country in scoring. They've got. Tremendous guard play. I think they're nine and two going into um, uh, going into Christmas here. They got one more game, then they get into conference play in Conference USA, where they're going to be one of the favorites with Florida Atlantic and Western Kentucky and North Texas. I think those four are all really, really good teams. And uh, but you know, you win with guards and, and gains is uh, really, really good complement uh, to Jelly Walker. They got a really nice backcourt. Jelly can do a lot of the scoring. Uh, Gaines can do a lot of the defending and, and setting guys up and, and that sort of thing. So he's an electric player. We knew that. 
Uh, we just wanted to make sure he was electric for our team and not the other team, which he had to do sometimes. But he's uh, he's continued to get better. He's continued to improve. I'm, I'm proud of how uh, how well he's doing at UAB. Coach Kennedy, Coach Cross, those guys have done done a really really good job with him. Um, another uh, SEC matchup. Uh, Auburn dropped another game against US USC um, this weekend. That's still not shooting the ball well, and they turned the ball over I think 23 times. Um, what did you see in that loss? Yeah, very sloppy. I thought Auburn. Um, in the second half, you know, I think they turned it over 15 or 16 times in the second half. Now, give them credit. They play so hard. They still had opportunities to win. Uh, Trey Donaldson's really come on for him. He's a freshman from out of Jackson, I mean, out of Jacksonville, out of Tallahassee, Florida. He went to University High School, which is like the lab school over at Baton Rouge or at LSU. That's like the lab school uh, for uh for Florida State and uh, Auburn got him out there. He's a two-sport athlete. I believe he plays baseball as well, but really, really uh, good player. He had 10 points in the first half of the game at Southern Cal. I say that to say he looks to be a steadying presence at, at the guard spot, not quite as jittery and up and down as uh, as, as Jasper and, and, and Window Green and some of those guys. So I think they may have, obviously it was a, it was a, it was a tough loss uh, at Southern Cal, but I think they may have found something that they can they can work with uh, in, in terms of uh, Trey Donaldson at guard. I think this is he played pretty well against Georgia State as well in the game before this back in Auburn, and so I think they may have found something they can work with to cut those turnovers down, maybe be a little bit more efficient, not take such uh, not take such uh, uh, you know wild shots as some of their guards take. But we'll see. They got another big game. They're on a Pac-12 road trip. They got Southern Cal. Obviously, they played them Sunday, and then they're at Washington, which is uh, which will be a very very uh, challenging game. Keon Brooks, who played uh, you know at Kentucky the last couple years, is Washington's uh, one of Washington's leading scorers. Great great player. Um, somebody that uh, that I always loved. I thought he was one of the best players in the league. I thought he was a really really good four man. Um, and then, uh, you know, Washington also has one of the best freshmen in the, in the, in the country, uh, Keon Minifield. Not a lot of people know about him. He's out west. He actually led the EYBL in scoring. He's skinny, uh, but he's an unbelievable athlete. He led Washington in scoring the other night. I think he had 13-14. He's electric, electric. He comes off the bench for Washington, but he's going to be a really, really, uh, really, really good player. Kid from uh, the Chicago area, Gary, Indiana, I believe. But it uh, should be a really good matchup. We'll see. We'll see how Donaldson plays on another tough, tough road game at, at, at Washington. But I, I do think Auburn found something they can work with uh, with Donaldson. He, he gives them a little bit more of a, a, a steady hand. Yeah, uh, sticking with Auburn, but kind of shifting back to the NBA. They obviously are missing um, Jabari Smith Jr., who's a big part of you know their offense last season uh, and their success there. Um, but he hasn't really you know transitioned quite. As and easily. they miss Walker, Kessler. They yes. miss Kessler big time. I don't know if you know that. I mean, Kessler played volleyball on our shots last year in Auburn. <laughs> we worked for two days on playing off two feet and doing all this pivoting and all this stuff. Our guys went in there off one foot and just – I mean, Kessler Kessler had like nine blocks on us. But, yeah, they miss Smith and and Kessler. And, uh, you know, Smith's going to be a really good NBA player. I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah. No. But Smith's going to be a really good NBA player. Sometimes it takes, it takes time. It's a different game, different speed. Um, there, there's a lot of adjustments that that, that, that have to be made. And um, Smith's uber talented. He's got a great head on his shoulders. He's very, very smart. Um, he's going to be somebody that, that when it clicks at the next level, I think he's going to be a tremendous, tremendous player. But he's, uh, you know, he certainly was a great college player for Auburn last year. You got him the ball at the elbows. Auburn got him the ball at the elbows a ton, and they're just – there wasn't a whole lot you could do. When he got the ball at the elbows, he was going to make something happen, score it, or, or find a way to, to, to make some good things happen. And so I thought he was really good for them. And like I said, Kessler, somebody they miss. And a lot of, you know, look, you forget they had two first-round picks on their front line now with Smith and Kessler. So that can cover up some of the issues with some guards and some of the other issues that are going on. Anytime you got two first-round picks, that, 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 that covers a lot of stuff up. And so they've got some talented players with, with Cardwell and, and, and Johan and, and uh, Chris Moore and, and, and some of those other guys that they have on their front line. But – um, you know they need they certainly need their guards to be better, but I, I got no doubt Jabari is going to be be a very very good uh, and very very capable NBA player. 
Um, another loss for the SEC, Alabama. You know, it seems like they finally lost one of those big games. They've been able to step up in those games all season, but they drop um, with a 10-point loss to Gonzaga. What did you see in that matchup? Well, I thought it was a great game, fast-paced, up and down. I thought both teams uh, were really good uh, offensively. I mean, how good is Brandon Miller, uh, the, the, the freshman from Alabama? Tremendous, tremendous uh, player. I think he had 30-some-odd in the game. I mean, he was – he was awesome. Drew Timmy from Gonzaga is so good. Give Gonzaga a lot of credit. They've navigated a really, really tough non-conference schedule. They're nine and three. They got a home buy game left, so I think they'll go into West Coast Conference play ten and three. But they've navigated a really, really tough non-conference schedule. But I think Alabama is a tremendous, tremendous team. Uh, I think uh, I think them and Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky. I think those are those are your top four. But I, I mean. I think Alabama and Tennessee may be a little bit better than Arkansas and Kentucky right now. Uh, that was the first time Alabama's defense has really let them down, but Gonzaga's so explosive offensively and so good offensively. It's not that much, um, you know, I don't think it's that much of a surprise that, uh, that, that, that the defense um, gave up 100 points uh, to, to, to Gonzaga. But Alabama's been really, really solid defensively most of the year. Uh, the freshman clown he's been been tremendous for him, Noah Clowney. He's been he's been he's been awesome. Mark Sears has been solid at, 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 at guard for him. Jaden Bradley's uh, continuing to play better. Got off to a little bit of a slow start, but he he's continuing to play better. So I like their pieces. I think their team fits uh, really really well together. But Alabama's just got to be. You know, got to get back to what they had been doing on defense, which is being really good. And, you know, Tennessee's obviously got some questions on the offensive end. Kentucky's got some questions uh, on the offensive end. And I think Arkansas's got a few questions with their with, with their depth. Um, but uh, I think all four of those are very, very good teams. And I think that the, the league's uh, pretty, pretty top heavy. Um, continuing off with that game, but on Gonzaga, Drew Timmy, you know, let, obviously led the way for them with 29 and 10. Um, you know, he's been able to play so well in the college game. Do you see um, his success being able to translate to the next level? Where do you see him fitting at in, in the NBA? Yeah, I mean, you know, he could be a small ball five at the next level. You know, he, he, he doesn't, uh, doesn't shoot it necessarily as, as well as he would need to to be that better. I mean, when he gets in the paint, he's got all sorts of finishes, all sorts of pivots. He's a really, really... Uh, crafty and, 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 and smart player uh, when he's, uh, you know, when he's inside and, and, and when he's in the paint. So I think there's certainly a, certainly a place for him. It, you know, just like, just like anything, it's about, it's about fit, it's about opportunity, and he's got to find the place that, that, uh, that, that, that's a good fit for him and, and gives him a, a good opportunity uh, for success. But there's certainly teams out there, there's teams out there that he can be uh, effective with and teams that he would be very good, uh, very good with. And so I think there's no doubt he's got a got an NBA, you know, an NBA future. But for now, I mean, he is a heck of a college basketball player. He's he uh, he does a great job for uh, for Gonzaga. They run everything through him. I mean, he made some great passes down the stretch, too. He found a couple cutters uh, when Alabama was really uh, putting two and three guys around him when he caught the ball. Uh, he found some cutters and did, did did a really really nice job. So I think he's uh, you know he's going to be one of the the uh, one of the one of the guys right there for for national player of the year in college basketball. Doesn't it feel like he's the perfect Golden State Warrior? It feels like he would fit that team perfectly. Yeah, he could. You know, they play small ball. He's somebody who who does a lot of things that uh, that that they value. I think that's a. That's a good. Uh, that's that's a good observation. I think I think he can bring. He'll bring a lot of value uh, to an organization. There's no doubt about that. 100. Um, percent One of the SEC teams you touched on in that last question was Tennessee. Um, they weren't able to get it done against Arizona this weekend. Um, what happened in that matchup that that the Volunteers weren't able to get the win? Well, I thought their you know I thought their their defense was solid. Uh, really, you know, their offense was 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 just okay. Their guards didn't shoot it well enough for them to win. Vescovi and Ziegler, uh, those guys are gonna have to shoot it better for them to win, especially uh, especially big games. And so, you know, I, I think they they're a work in progress offensively. I think they're elite by any by any stretch of the imagination. 
Uh, defensively, I, I think they're one of the top two or three teams in the country. Uh, defensively, they just got to figure out how to generate more offense and more consistent offense, particularly from their from their point guard, two guard, and, and even their threes. And so, uh, you know, that's going to be the challenge uh, for Tennessee. But because they're because they're so good defensively, they're going to be in every game. They're going to have opportunities. Uh, in every game because they're, they're, they're just elite defensively, just like, you know, they go on the road to a very, very good Arizona team, and, and they gave themselves a chance. They had a chance coming down the stretch. They were in the game the entire game. They just couldn't make enough shots. They just couldn't make enough plays uh, offensively to, uh, to, to to finish it off. But, you know, th there's somebody that's going to be very, very consistent. They're not going to lose a lot of games they shouldn't lose. Uh, because their defense keeps them in a lot of games, and so they'll they'll uh, they'll win a, they'll, they'll, they'll run up a lot of wins uh, in SEC play. They got one more tune up here uh, before they start SEC play, and then they'll then they'll be then they'll be right into the uh, to the gauntlet. But I think they're they're really really prepared. I mean, if I had to if I had to bet on anybody right now, I'd bet on them to win the league. Um, I think Alabama's probably second, but I think Alabama. I think they're more prone to maybe lose to somebody they shouldn't lose to than Tennessee is. Um, and then I'd put Arkansas third, probably Kentucky fourth, and, and Mississippi State fifth. Uh, after that, I think it's wide open. I think there's there's quite a few teams that could come in anywhere from six to six to ten, six to eleven. I think the bottom three are pretty pretty pretty, pretty cut and dry uh, with with South Carolina and, and Vanderbilt and um, Georgia. Although Georgia picked up a, a, a big win. Uh, yesterday against 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 Notre Dame uh, in, uh, in in Atlanta, but I think I think those 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 top four are pretty well set. But I, I give Tennessee the edge just because their defense is so good and they'll grind out enough points. I mean, if you hold somebody to 55, the law of averages says you can score 56, 57, and they're going to be able to do that a lot of the time. And so you know they just got to find a way to get a little bit more potent offensively, which is a little bit tough because. They do a really good job of playing complementary basketball. So they have all those great defensive numbers, but they have it because, you know, their offense helps their defense out. They don't turn the ball over a lot. They take high, you know, they, they do a lot of things offensively to help their defense out and keep them, keep them in a good space. And so, um, you know, they got to figure out a way to, to generate, a, you know, some more points offensively, but not, but, but still not affecting their bread and butter, which is their elite defense. Coach, on a scale of 1 to 100, how confident are you that Tennessee will win the league? If you used to get what I'm saying. You're picking up what I'm putting down. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not – I'd say – 20? I'd say – I mean, look, they also have – I mean, look, part of it is, too, they get – I think they get Vanderbilt twice. They get Kentucky twice, which is obviously tough. And I think they get Georgia. And I think Georgia's their permanent rival. They get – you know, part of it is who your permanent rivals are. Um. I, I, I'd give them a 60% chance to win it. Um, you talked about, you know, those top four teams, and the one you put in at five was Mississippi State. They had a close one against Nichols um, this weekend. How were, how were, did you see the end of that by any chance? I, I did not. What, Nichols, so Nichols, it was a two-point game. Mississippi State's inbounding the ball. probably the only person in the country <laughs> watching this. Uh, so – uh, Austin Clanch is a good friend of mine, the coach at Nichols. Great guy. Good, good, really good, uh, really good program down there. Good, good, good folks. Um, Nichols, so Mississippi State calls timeout. Nichols steals the inbounds pass and shoots, has a wide open three to win the game with two seconds left and misses it. And then they miss a tip in that would have won the game, to, or that would have tied the game and sent it to overtime. So, Nichols, Nichols had their opportunities. You know, it'd be interesting. Uh, Mississippi State's got a, a, a critical game at Drake tomorrow, or against Drake tomorrow in Nebraska, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And, you know, Mississippi State's, they're kind of, um, uh, they're, they're, they're leaking oil a little bit right now. They had a really tight game with Jackson State in their, in, their, in their annual game that they play in Jackson at the Mississippi Coliseum there where they have the state tournament. Uh, they had a really, really tight game with Jackson State earlier in the week. They played a really tight game with Nichols. Uh, now they've got a really good Drake team with, with uh, the coach's son at Drake as an NBA prospect, Tucker DeVries. I mean, tremendous, tremendous player. So they've got a really tough game with Drake tomorrow. It'll be interesting to see how they respond. You know, I was watching 
uh, Coach Jans's reaction after that Nichols game. You can see after he shook their hands, he was ready to just go rip somebody in that locker room. So it'll be interesting how they respond. You know, they're obviously off to an 11-0 start. Their defense is elite. Uh, they've played good complementary offense, playing through Tolu Smith. Uh, DJ Jeffries has played well. Cam Matthews has played well when he needs to. Um, so, you know, they've, they've, they've kind of been sneaking around and poking around a little bit. But, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see if they can kind of turn it back up. It, it, it looks like, you know, going into the break here, they're, 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 they're leaking oil. And I never liked, if I could help it, playing good teams going into Christmas like this. But maybe this, I always like to play a bum so we could know we were going to win. If your guys were, if your guys were a little bit distracted or worried about other stuff, that you still had, you still had a pretty good shot. You knew you were going to win. But, you know, them playing, them playing uh, in a, in a Lincoln against against uh, Drake. This may be what they need. Maybe they've gotten bored because they're playing these other teams, and maybe they need to play a good team, a good team from the Missouri Valley, and. Maybe this is what Mississippi State needs to kind of uh, ignite them and kickstart them and, and, and get them back going. So we'll uh, we'll see how that game goes tomorrow. But that's a, that's a that's a critical swing game. I'm shoot they'll enter they'll enter SEC play 12 and 0. And they can just walk the dog in SEC play. They're going to get in the they're going to get in the NCAA tournament. Uh, they're going to be really really tough to beat in Starkville, um, just because of how good the defense is and the crowds are going to come out. And they'll be a, they'll be a tough out in Starkville. Um, to kind of, you know, separate from the SEC, Houston was able to bounce back from that loss against Alabama with a big win over Virginia. Um, how were they able to get that done? Huge win. I thought their guards played well. They got some critical offensive rebounds, uh, which is hard to come by against Virginia. They don't, they don't give up a lot of offensive rebounds, but just a typical gutty uh, Houston, uh, Houston game. And so Houston does subscribe to my theory. They've got McNeese State early, coming up this week, uh, going into, going into Christmas break. So they do subscribe to my, to my, to my Christmas time, uh, theory. But, uh, uh, but when I was at Chattanooga, I used to always try to schedule one of my buy games right here too, to see if I, you know, against a high major to see if I catch one of them sleeping a little bit, maybe not get my doors blown off so much. But I thought, I thought Houston, um, I thought Houston did a really, really uh, good job of just guarding uh, Virginia, making them earn everything. They didn't let them get out in, in in transition, and then you know they ran good offense. They got really good stuff. They they started short rolling. Uh, they started slipping and short rolling a lot of their ball screens, getting the ball to the middle, and their bigs were able to fan it out for open threes. Were able to. Uh, hit little um, touch shots in the lane. They really did a nice job of taking advantage of Virginia's hard hedging and found ways to get the ball into the paint, get the ball into the teeth of the defense off the pass, which it's really hard to get the ball into the middle of the defense of the teeth of the defense against Virginia uh, on the on the bounce. And so I thought Houston did a nice job adjusting as the game went on and getting it in the middle of that defense off the pass and then those guys being able to make plays for themselves or make plays for other and fanning it out. But really, really good win for Houston. I thought it was an important game for Houston. I mean, they needed that for their resume. I mean, you know, for them, it's going to be whether they're a one, two or three seed. But that was that was an important game because they have a win at Oregon, but Oregon's not, you know, not not great right now. Um, they lost uh, they lost that home game against Alabama, which was which was a, another opportunity to pick up a a quality win, but they, they picked up a huge win at Virginia. And I mean, you'd have to say Virginia right now is the the uh, the odds on favorite. I know y'all like me doing this, but they're the odds on favorite in the ACC right now, from what I've seen. Um, I think I think they would be the team to beat in the ACC. I think there's more of a gap between them and the rest of the ACC than there is between Tennessee and the rest of the SEC. To answer your next question, <laughs> um, but uh, already putting it in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you got Lloyd. It's legal now. You you can just get on. Yeah, 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 coach. If I can't go on vacation, I gotta make you know. I gotta make my hay somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they don't pay you enough. You can't. You, so you gotta earn your vacation. Exactly. You, you'll go broke listening to my advice. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> well, they'll come. But, they'll come uh, back. <laughs> but uh, no, I think I think it was a huge, huge win for Houston to win that on the road. Just said, you know, just two really tough, really, really well coached. Uh, really, really uh, good teams, and I thought I thought Houston did a did a did a really nice job uh, pulling that out. 
Uh, they, yeah, they were led by uh, Jerace Walker, the freshman. We've talked about how you know good the freshmen are in the SEC, but really in the entire country. Um, you know, you see f freshmen all over the place, uh, and he was able to hit a you know a big fall away shot there at the end to kind of you know seal the game. Um, wh what have you seen from from Jerace Walker? Well, I don't know if you know this. We had him on a visit at LSU. We loved him. Uh, he's from he's from Baltimore area. He went to IMG, but uh, Jarris is a is a is a he's first off he's an unbelievable person, uh, unbelievable uh, young man, and, and has a great uh, has a great vibe to him. Houston have been recruiting him for for two or three years. Uh, Qantas and those guys did a, did an unbelievable job recruiting him. They deserve to get him. They they recruited him longer and harder and all the rest of us. And, and, and they, they, they deserve to get him. But he comes from a great AAU program, same AAU program as James Bishop, who played for his Team Thrill out of Baltimore Under Armour program. Like I said, went to IMG, uh, was coached by Sean McAloon there, who's a really, really good coach. Uh, and so, you know, he, he was more prepared than most because he played on a national stage. But I think Houston was a great fit for him. You know, he wanted to be coached hard. Coach Sampson, there's not anybody who coaches kids much harder in the country than he does, but those kids love him. And I thought, I thought he made a really, really uh, good, good choice. I told him that when he called to tell me he was going to Houston, I said, I, I don't blame you one bit, man. You made <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good choice. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm at least honest. I know when kids are a good fit for us, when they're not, now he was talented. We'd have made a, he'd, he'd been a great player for us. Don't get me wrong, but he, 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 he's really tailor made for what, for what Houston does. And he's had some really big games for him and their biggest games. He's played extremely, extremely well. He played well at Oregon. You know, that's a, that's a great trait to have, but I think he's going to be a, a, you know, a, a top half of the first round uh, draft pick. And, uh, you know, for him to be able to expand his game and come out and shoot a little bit and make some threes, he made a three in that game, make some, make, make some tough shots like that fadeaway you were talking about. Um, you know, he's going to continue to continue to get better. Houston's going to make sure he rebounds and does all the other things that he needs to get where he wants to go. But I think I think he's uh, he's quietly having a very, very good freshman year. You, when you mentioned the best freshman in the country, he needs to be in the conversation. Um, one team that, you know, isn't talked about quite as much as Duke, which is surprising because they still have so much talent on their roster, um, but they're just not in that, that top half of the rankings. Why? Why is why is Duke not being talked about as much as some of these other programs? Well, it's rare you're not talking about Duke. They open ACC play. I think they are. They got their second ACC game. They beat Boston College, or they got Wake Forest this week um, in ACC play. And I think Duke's really good. I like what what Coach Shire's done. I mean, he's he's uh, he's changed up a little bit what they do offensively. They run a lot more stuff out of horn sets. They run a lot more a lot more uh, a lot more actions. I think he's done a really really uh, nice job. He's done a good job of incorporating their their talented freshmen with uh, with, with some of the uh, you know with some of the older guys. I, I, I saw the day where they should get Roach back here uh, pretty soon, which will which will help them potentially for that Wake Forest game tomorrow night, which will be uh, extremely extremely helpful for them. So I think Duke's I think Duke's really good. I think they're the second best team in the ACC. Uh, to, uh, to 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 Virginia, and I think they're going to be a top ten team. You know, one of the top four seeds in the NCAA tournament. You know, one, two, three, or four seed, and I think they're going to have a chance to really, really uh, make some noise. And so, I think I think Coach Shire's done a really, really good job. Not only with the basketball, he's kind of rebranded Duke, got a little more, uh, given a little bit more modern flavor a little bit more modern flash and i think the kids have really taken to that as you can see from their recruiting and i think i think he's done a done a, done a really nice job coach how hard is that like it seems like almost an impossible position for coach shire to come in after coach k obviously gets his flowers on the way out but whenever you have to replace a legend like that how do you even go about it like you don't want to change the entire culture because obviously coach k was doing some things correct but you also want to be your own man at some point correct yeah, I think he's done a good job of keeping the the, 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 the staples of what they do, but adding Slap his own floor. personality. I mean, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's added his own personality to it. They went out and hired an assistant from outside the, you know, with Jay Lucas from outside the, 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 the brotherhood, as they call it, you know, from outside their family. He brought in a guy, um, Emil Jefferson. He moved him up to an assistant who I think is a rising, rising star in, in, in coaching. He's phenomenal. 
Uh, he's he's going to be a head coach sooner rather than, than, than later. He played at Duke, played in the NBA, played in the G League. He's done a little bit of everything. He was one of the administrative guys. But he's going to be he, he, he's going to be a ph phenomenal uh, asset to them. And, I, you know, I think he's done a good job of understanding, hey, what we have at Duke is, is special and unique and a little bit different. And we need to keep that keep that uniqueness and keep 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 that, um, you know, keep that, you know, how different we are. But we also need to make sure that we're keeping up with everybody else and we understand what uh, what all else is going on out there in college basketball what all else is going on out there in the world and we need to keep up with those guys as well and we need to have some outside maybe a few more outside voices than we've uh, than, than we've had in the past and so i think he's done a nice job of of balancing uh, of balancing both of those um staying in the acc north carolina finally looked like the team that we saw in the tournament last year um when they were able to they were able to put you know, points on the board and beat Ohio State uh, in overtime. Um, Baycott had 28, Love 22, Davis 21. Um, what was what was different? How were they able to, to get it done um, this weekend? Well, it was, a, it was a huge win for them. I mean, they needed that bad. They kind of sputtered through the non-conference. They needed that bad. I mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's too much. Uh, it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that. You know, that shot Pete Nance hit may have, I mean, that may have jolted North Carolina. That may have been just what they needed, just what the doctor, uh, just what the doctor ordered. Hopefully this will kind of get them going like they did in February of last year when they were kind of sputtering along and trying to figure out how to make the NCAA tournament. And then all of a sudden they got, they got off and got rolling and the rest is history. They played for the national title. So maybe that'll happen a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier uh, a little bit earlier this time, a little bit earlier uh, with with with, uh, with their play in Madison Square Garden. I thought it was interesting. That's the first time Carolina had played in Madison Square Garden in like mm. over ten years, which I thought was wild. You know, Duke Duke set up like a second home up at Madison Square Garden, and a lot of these teams play up there all the time. It's a phenomenal venue, phenomenal place. Uh, we were actually the COVID year. We were going to play Syracuse at, at the Garden. Uh, when we were at LSU, and that, I was looking forward to that. But uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, venue. But I thought it was interesting. Carolina hadn't played there in a while, but I thought their I thought their fans showed out. I thought their program uh, really showed well on TV, and I thought it was a huge, huge win for them. Much like you said, that the, the two guards, Davis and Love, played well. Baycott uh, did what he does, which those big three are going to have to play well. Uh, most nights for, for for Carolina to win, and we'll see if this is the kickstart they needed heading into uh, heading into SEC play. But it was a it was a heck of a uh, heck of a ball game for sure. You know, everybody's going to talk about Nance's shot, but I thought they did a really really good job of not trying to run a full court play. They got the ball to half court, called timeout, so then they could set that play up from half court as opposed to running a full court play. So I thought it was really, really good coaching and really, really sound strategy by Coach Davis down the stretch. Yeah, that play um, that they ran for Nance to get that last shot, um, obviously you pointed it out because it was very similar to, to something we've talked about earlier in one of these episodes. Lloyd, if you want to pull the clip up. Um, yeah, it was very similar. It was, the same, it was the same type action as that play we looked at from Penn State where they didn't, they didn't have to pass it out this time in the Penn State Clemson game in our first episode. They didn't have to pass it out to the wiper action up top this time because they only needed two to send it to overtime. But same type of play, they found a matchup they liked with a with a smaller guy on a taller guy, somebody who could shoot over. They got this fake action going on up top just to tie up the help so they can't so they can't help and he just shoots it right over. I mean, I'd have liked to see the kid from Ohio State jump up to contest it. You gotta jump to contest, you can't just have your hands there. But once again, that similar action, that Brad Stevens action, that Brad Stevens play, uh, a lot of teams are uh, a lot of teams are now going to that and it, it worked uh, it worked for Carolina on uh, on Saturday. Do you ever think that it's a risk? He didn't have great ball pressure on the ball. Uh, the guy didn't jump up to contest it. I mean, there's a couple things that, that Ohio State could have done better, uh, could have done better defensively uh, with that. But yeah, it's certainly a, a, a difficult pass. Yeah, he's just standing there. He should have jumped up uh, to to contest that. But but Ohio State uh, certainly could have made it more difficult. But yeah, it's, I mean, look, anytime you're in a late game situation or or, or in a in a in a in a late uh, in, in, a, in a late game uh, side out of bounds or full court, I mean, there, there's there's got to be a level of 
of luck involved because what you're doing is going to be um, in any late game situation. But it's uh, you know it's a it's a good play. The one thing it does do is it gives you if you miss you want to miss it to the area where there's space. You saw all that space on that on that wing for for North Carolina. So you tell your guy throwing the ball, look if you miss it you miss it in space. Like I used to tell our guys, if you miss a lob pass, you better throw that thing out of bounds. Never throw a lob short. Like you better throw it out of bounds. So that way we, we can at least set our defense. Don't ever miss a lob pass short. On that pass, if you're going to miss it, miss it over to where the UCLA is. Like that would be what the perfect pass. Miss it where your guys got inside position and can go get it. So there's a lot of little teaching points, uh, a lot of little teaching points on that that you can – uh, that you can, uh, you know, that you can find. And I thought North Carolina did a really, really good job executing it. And coach, real quick, if you talked about trying to defend that play, I mean, obviously he's trying not to foul in that scenario, right? You don't want to give him an opportunity to go to the free throw line. Correct. So that's why you don't but leave you your feet. Jump, I mean, you can still jump up to contest. You, you, you can still jump up and contest. I mean, he just gave the guy an unabated shot. You know, it was just him in the rim. He just gave him a, a, a relatively... Uh, a relatively easy look. Uh, how big of a piece for North Carolina success is Nance? You know, you, he's not really the, the I mean, headliner. Well, well, I mean, yeah, they had Brady Manick last year who was phenomenal for him, and they basically brought in Nance from the transfer portal to help with Brady with Brady Manick, uh, with Brady Manick being gone. And so, I, you know, I think him continuing to play well, maybe this gives him the confidence that he needs to, 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 to play well and do what he needs to do. Uh, move, moving, moving forward here, and so hopefully this will uh, this will give him the jolt that he needs as well to uh, to, to 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 add to those other guys with Baycode and, and 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 Davis and Love, and hopefully it'll hopefully it'll add to that with uh, you know with uh, with Nance uh, picking things up now. Yeah. Sometimes all you need is a little jolt of confidence and, and, and a big time shot like that, and just for their coaches to to call the play to go to him and. You know, to find the play to go to him, that that, that gives him a little bit of confidence. So I, I think they, you know, we'll see how he, we'll see how he progresses and how he builds from this. But I think there's certainly something there to work with. Yeah, and you bring up, you know, obviously Nance was brought over in the transfer portal. Um, as a coach, how difficult is it to kind of balance out your your recruitment almost by doing high school players, portal players, seeing who's going to stay on the roster? We've seen it in college football be kind of difficult. You know, to, to balance that out, especially with eligibility, um, how, how difficult is that as a coach in college basketball? Yeah, it's, it's not easy, but I mean, shoot, you get paid a lot of money, so you got to figure it out, right? I mean, everybody who complains about it, like, all right, well, go sell insurance or something if you don't want problems, <laughs> right? I mean, like, it's, it's not produce easy. a podcast. Yeah, I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, like, it is what it is. It's part of the job. I mean, I, you know, look, it's it it is what it is. The the you know, you just gotta you gotta make sure that you keep all the guys on your team that you want to keep that's number one you know that i was i was always trying to make sure that we didn't have any surprises on on who we lost or, or, or anything like that i wanted to make sure we wanted to keep the guys that we wanted to keep that was that was always important and then finding freshmen that you thought could make uh could make an impact and then uh and then you know you, you've got to um, you know, you got to scour the transfer portal for guys that fit what you, uh, you know, that fit what you do. So I think, uh, you know, I think, I think all good teams are comprised of, of, of all of that now. Guys who have been in your program, guys who transfer into your program, and guys who are, who are freshmen who are coming in. And so the trick now is, you know, when you get a talented freshman, you got to play them or they're going to be gone. Um, so you, you, you've really got to, got to play them and, um, you know, some some would say I probably played some of my freshmen too much, but shoot, if I was if I knew I was going to have them for a year, I might as well play them a lot. What good does it do for to have them for a year if I'm not going to play them a ton? Uh, that's the way I looked at it. Uh, and so, you know, just let them let them ride out there and roll out. But you know, roster management's a huge part. You you look at what we're talking about with Duke. I mean, Duke's hired a general manager who oversees a lot of their stuff. I think that's going to be commonplace in, in in high major basketball to hire. Hire uh, hire folks to, to, to oversee the, the the building of the roster and, and, and the roster in general. Mm -hmm. I had a guy on my staff who did that, Nelson Hernandez, who was my he's technically my I don't even know what he was director of operations I think, but I mean he was basically he was our general manager. I mean he man, he had the board in his office. He did all the 
you know, he, of course, old Nelly now, he won't keep anybody anytime. He's ready to get rid of everything. <laughs> you have one back on a one day contract, Nelly. Uh, that's why I love him. You're on a one day contract with them. Uh, but uh, sometimes I'd have to calm him down. That's not good when I'm calming him down. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he, he'd want to he'd want to ride this guy out of there. I said, no, no, let's give it another game or two. I'm just telling. I'm just telling. But uh, yeah, you, everybody's got somebody who kind of kind of functions as uh, as as that general manager. All right, coach. Well, that's it for today. I appreciate it. Um, it was another good another good episode. I don't, you know, I'm sure we'll have next next Monday off. So. Yeah. Good. Now give me a week to get this microphone right. Yeah. <laughs> when we come back, we're gonna have this microphone right. We better, get coach. This we... microphone right. We'll be in good shape. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I have to. I have to read another YouTube comment about it. Where then it's then you know I might have to talk to old Nelly. No, we're gonna get this microphone right. I'll have it hooked up, ready to go next uh, next show. What's uh, Christmas like at the old Wade household this year? We're gonna go. Uh, actually, we just got back from my parents. We did fam my family this week. We're gonna do my wife's family uh, on Christmas. So we're going to Charlotte, and uh, it'll be fun. There we go. Well, Merry Christmas, Coach. Same to you guys. Thanks right. so much. Yeah, absolutely.